that was the lowest point I've ever felt. I, I, I can see that this is the leading cause of death in our country. How can I change this? I mean, nobody's doing this. And if I don't do it, no one's going to touch mm. this. Every night, I felt like I was with him. I'm like, wow, I should just stay in bed the rest of my life and, and not be a parent, not participate in life and all the dreams I had. Um, I didn't know how I was going to survive. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Law of Attraction Secrets podcast. I'm your host, Natasha Graziano. And as always, I bring you the latest, the best, the coolest, the most inspirational humans from around the world. People who I believe you will learn something from, who I believe will change your life. And today, that is one of those humans. One of those people that I've recently encountered, come across, been introduced to, who I've been so excited to bring to your screens, to bring to your ears. So first of all, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you to everyone that shares the episode every week on their social and tags me in it. And I just appreciate every one of you. Hannah, big shout out. Hannah Malay, I think you're wonderful. Every time you, you put in that effort. I want to give a shout out to Daniel Thomas as well for being such an amazing advocate of the show. Anytime that you guys do it, I just want to shout out some of you and just say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I see any more this week, I will definitely be shouting out some more next week. So stay tuned. Today we have a spectacular guest, somebody who is a walking miracle. Somebody who was told 31 years ago that she had MS and that was it. She would probably not still be around to this day, but she is. Wait till you meet this queen. She is somebody who has two charities and has a story that is meant to be heard by the world. And that is why she is doing the unbelievable things that she has. She's overcome the darkest. She's overcome health challenges, which you would never deem possible. She's going on and inspiring so many people around the world. Welcome to the show, Nancy Davis. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. What a pleasure to be here. I mean, as soon as I heard your story, I was like, we have to share this with my audience. That there's somebody out there today that needs this. I don't know who you are, but there's somebody that this is for today. Let's go straight to it. 31 years ago, what was that phone call? I, I, I was skiing in Aspen. I fell. Uh, I, I tore ligaments in my knees. I was going to have to have surgery. I woke up three weeks later, and all of a sudden, I started losing the feeling in uh, the three fingertips of my right hand, then my whole hand. Three days later, the three fingertips of my left hand, then my whole hand. Then my eyesight went. Um, I called my doctor, and he, he said, you've got to have an MRI. And I, I figured it had to do with the accident I had, but it didn't. Uh, I was diagnosed very quickly with MS, which is pretty unusual. It usually takes a lot longer. I got diagnosed, but the doctor who I first went to who diagnosed me told me I would never walk again. Um, I was a young mom with three little kids, and I had so many dreams and hopes for my life. And in that first visit of saying you know, that I had MS, he said... Um, you know, you just, just go home and go to bed. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? I said, isn't there medicine I can take? Well, there's no medicine. There's nothing you could take. Uh, there's no therapies. There's nothing you could do. And I'm like, well, there has to be something. And he said, you know what? You're very lucky because you can probably have people bring you food in your room. I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a great life for a 33-year-old. Um, I can have food be brought to my room. He said, you'll probably be able to operate the remote control on your TV set. I'm like, wow, I should just stay in bed the rest of my life and, and not be a parent, not participate in life and all the dreams I had. Um, I was fortunate. I went and got a second opinion the next day. Uh, two days later, I got another opinion. A week later, I got another opinion. I kept getting second opinions, praying, in fact, that somebody would say, you don't have MS. Unfortunately, everyone told me have MS, but the reality is there's a lot of different prognoses, and I started learning that it was going to be up to me to make this dream come true. I went from doctor to doctor, different hospitals, some of the best hospitals in the country, from Harvard to Yale to the Cleveland Clinic to Johns Hopkins to UCLA to USC, and um, every one of the 
doctors uh, after they told me I had MS uh, sat down and told me about the research that they were doing. And I was, I was fascinated to learn about it. But it was fascinating that every single doctor was copying each other. They were doing the same thing. And when I would bring that up to the other doctor, they would say, well, no, you, you're not a doctor. You don't know what you're talking about. I said, no, you're copying exactly what Harvard's doing, what Yale's doing. Yale's doing what Johns Hopkins is doing. And, wow. and you guys don't really get it. So I thought in that moment, um, I'd already worked on a charity for diabetes. My little sister's a juvenile diabetic. And my mom, Barbara Davis, has this great center for diabetes. I'd always worked on that. I thought in that moment, I'm going to have to create my own charity because uh, there, there's nothing for MS. It was really upsetting. So I thought if we could put the best and the brightest to work as a team and get these brilliant doctors and, and to the point where they had to communicate every single month via database or meet in person. And anything that happened, good or bad, they had to report. Um, doctors don't like to report negative medical research studies. They don't like to talk about it. They think it's you know embarrassing or makes them look bad. The bad is just as important as the good in any research. That helps other doctors not go down that same road or spend the same amount of money, time and energy again and again to get the same results. So it was really exciting. Um, what's the most exciting thing. We have something called the Center Without Walls because we've never spent any money to create this. We just have the most brilliant doctors. Um, it was wow. so, it's so exciting today. We, we Everybody thought it was a horrible idea in the beginning. And I, I loved the idea. And I just sort of pushed it because it made all the sense in the world. Today, um, for that young person being diagnosed with MS, there's a really bright, positive future. There's these amazing drugs that, that, that deplete your B cells. And they know when your B cells act up, that starts the whole ball rolling with you having MS attacks. And it's it's pretty amazing. There, there's two drugs that we'd, we'd funded um, called, you know, Ocrevus and Casimpta. And if you look at those today, it's, it's the gold standard. And about 90% of the people who take it will do well and have their future and be that young 33-year-old like me who's just had a child and be able to look forward to a future, being independent, taking care of their children, reaching their dreams. So it's exciting. Um, there's now 25 drugs on the market wow. to help stop the progression of MS. When I started, there was zero. There was zero hope that there would be anything. Everybody told me I have a very unpopular disease. It's not affecting enough people. So in fact, that that wouldn't uh, ever, ever be funded because it didn't affect enough people. Um, today, the drug companies that make these drugs and others are making billions of dollars a year, and it's helping a lot of people. So I'm, I'm very grateful for everybody who supported my charity. Over the years, Race to Race MS, we, we've gotten somewhere. We're not there. We have a ways to go, and there's a lot of people who still are suffering, but a lot of people are doing really, really well, and it, it's, it's, it's such a great feeling. Such a beautiful story. I literally look at you and just think you are such an inspiration. Thank you. You look That's amazing. So you are pure to your soul, just filled with love and light for everyone. And you came in with a bundle of gifts for me today. I just felt so spoiled. Yeah. This beautiful necklace, peace and love. I'm wearing it here. You can probably see it's got the peace sign in the inside and the heart on the outside. And right. if anyone knows me, they know I love wearing hearts and I love wearing things that represent the peace, whether it's the yin yang or the peace symbol. I, I love it. So tell me a little bit about peace and love, and then we're going to go back uh, on So to yeah, I, I guess I have some peace and love, yeah. love things on me too. I started Peace and Love um, right after 9-11, and uh, the idea is, the heart is like, no matter who you are, where you live, whatever your religion, your beliefs, hopefully we all aspire in our life simply to having peace and love. It's it's a very positive message, and it's very important, and I, I have the trademark on everything, peace and love, and so uh, I've really grown with that, and it's been an exciting thing, and very often um, we'll make certain pieces that will benefit um, one of my two charities, either Race to Race MS or yep. Cure Addiction Now. And so it's really nice to do that. But I, I love to sit in my bed at night with my Bic pen and design jewelry. It's I just a, kind of a crazy thing. And I've, wow. I've sold it. Uh, Saks Fifth Avenue was my first store. Wow. We started there. Straight to the top queen. Yeah. You don't even play. Right. And then and then we made a less expensive line that was uh -huh. on QVC. And then it was on another a network called Shop HQ. Yep. And uh, we were sold in Australia. Now we're sold in you know different places um, all over. But uh, I, I it's it's really fun. It's a great creative out, creative outlet to to do it. And every every piece has a lot of meaning behind it. Um, I have a piece uh, that's a teddy bear here. I don't know if you can see that. But um, it's part of our charity cure addiction now, and it has to do with my son. My son Jason passed away unfortunately three and a half years ago, uh, right at the beginning of COVID. He he he'd suffered a lot from addiction, and he had a lot 
lot of trouble getting over it. He'd been sober for nine months though, and he died, and he actually got COVID, and and that's really the why COVID he passed actually, away. Yeah, really? he died of a double pulmonary embolism, which is when you get a blood clot in your leg and it travels up to your lung and cuts your breathing off in your sleep. And so unfortunately, that. But we had started a charity together. He came to me. He'd always help me on race to race MS. He was such a little pied piper. He came to every event. He'd he'd help me get auction items. He'd sell tables. He'd get entertainers. He was kind of that that kid. He was very wow. involved and so much fun. And so he came to me one day and he goes, Mom, I have a disease called addiction and it's not going away. And the twelve step program and AA and all that stuff, it's great for a lot of people, but it's not working for me. What was we need to find something else. He was addicted to opiates. Right. And he said, we've got to find something. We've got to do something science-based where we put the best of the best doctors yep. in the country to work also as a team, like we've done for, with the Center Without Walls for Race to Race MS. But we're going to call this Cure Addiction Now, or CAN. Mm -hmm. And so we had gotten our 501c3 about four months before he passed away. And we had this brilliant meeting in New York with the greatest doctors. And he really spoke to them about what he felt we needed to do for addiction. And we are, in fact, doing it. But unfortunately, he died four months later. And I was left uh, the most heartbroken mother. I, I, there's nothing worse than losing a child. It's, there's, there's, I, I can't even describe the feeling. It's horrible. But as time has gone on, I, I feel like he's uh, he's sitting on my shoulder. And How old was he? He was um, 35. But I feel like he's he's right here sitting on yep. my shoulder. Certain days, I, I look outside and I have a real thing about sunsets because he and I like sunsets. I had some great pictures of him with great sunsets um, before he passed away. And I feel like those nights when there's these spectacular sunsets, I feel like it's, it's him visiting me. Wow. And oh I gosh. feel his presence. I do. And those sunsets always happen on days when we're doing a huge amount of work. And wow. How stuff interesting. Stuff for, for Cure Addiction now. And we're having really, you know, great traction, great, so you know. It's like a sign that he's. Yeah, I feel like he's, he's saying thank you, and we're yes. doing this. I, I feel I feel his presence, and a lot of times on my Instagram account, I will I will post pictures of sunsets. But that's when I'm having a moment with my son. Wow! I, I really feel like there's something very spiritual and very uh, connected about doing that, and uh, love that. But we are um, we're getting somewhere, which is exciting. Um, Jason thought you know addiction is all about cravings, and the cravings start in your brain. Um, our government has never funded anything to do with cravings. We funded research rehab centers and different things, but not really understanding why do we have cravings? Why is there a genetic predisposition to, to becoming an addict? Why are all these things happening? How can we make it affordable and for everybody in the world to detox when they're on an, an Why addict? do people have cravings, by the way? Because you're born that way. And we're creating medications right now that are going to help stop your cravings. Um, there's this medicine we're working on that you take one pill. Yeah. It's called Ibogaine. It's not legalized in the country yet, but we're hoping it will be. And you take one you take one dose and you go on this crazy hallucinogenic trip for 12 to 24 hours. But when you wake up, you've gone through the entire detox and you don't have cravings for the next six months. So to me, that's, you know, that's brilliant. Um, there's other drugs that kind of mimic that too. And the idea that if you have to go to rehab, it's it's twenty five thousand to seventy five thousand dollars a month. Insurance does not cover it. If they will cover some small portion of it, that that would be a miracle, but they don't. And so most people can't afford to get sober. And it's really uh, inequitable and uh, and not well. And a lot of people, even when they go to rehab, they 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 relapse because they don't have the tools when they leave there to deal with. I mean, some people do brilliantly on AA and uh, all that. And that's that's great, but seven percent of the people are, are really cured by AA. But the other ninety three percent of the people are failing miserably again and again because they feel that that has to work for them. And sometimes it works, and if it works for you, amazing. But if it doesn't, what are you supposed to do? So is that what the charity does? The charity steps in now, and they we are creating medicines that will help everybody who right. has an addiction and every type of addiction. We're working on vaccines right now, and if it's something that's you're susceptible to having it in your family, maybe you will have a vaccine. If you you are addicted to opiates. We're de we're working on an, an opiate vaccine right now, so that if, once you've detoxed, you could maybe have this vaccine, and it would stop your cravings and stop you wanting to have it. Um, we're working on so many different things and um, medications. There's there's a medicine that we we worked on with one uh, uh, one of our doctors from Johns Hopkins. It's a medicine called Balsama. When you first detox, you have a terrible time sleeping, so it's a sleeping pill. But you don't get addicted to it because it's a non-narcotic. Mm. It also cuts your cravings down 50% wow. for using drugs. And this is all about, I mean, cravings are 
everything. And my son came to me, he goes, Mom, why isn't anybody studying cravings? He goes, why would I do something again and again that I know is really bad for me? If, if this is what happens to an addict. Why can't we have something that helps stop that? I mean, this is what we have to look at because nobody's ever bothered. So we are bothering and we're really it's working beautiful. on that in a big, big way. So that will help a lot of people. And that charity is called Cure Your Addiction, addiction now. now, or CAN, right. C-A-N, and uh, we're doing a lot of really exciting work there, and it's it's for 25 years, nobody put any significant money into actual basic science research for addiction, and you look at it, it's now the leading cause of death in our country. Is it really? For people 50 years old and younger, it, it is. 50 years yes. old Since and COVID younger. is over now. Well, I could have been that same person. I could have been the person who died from addiction. I, you know, have been clean seven years, but Congratulations. Thank you. That's a miracle. But drugs were like a real problem for me. I, I like couldn't get off. I just was obsessed with it. It was, I, but I knew it was bad for me. What was, was your drug? Cocaine of was my drug of choice, and it was just I, I did it, and I don't really speak too much about it. But this is like a, a place where I feel you totally, you know, it's yeah. a safe space. And They're you get working it. on a cocaine vaccine right now. Too. Really? Yeah, I've heard oh about. Oh my that, gosh! Well, I wouldn't. I, I look at it now, and I can you smile at it, again, yeah. and I can be like, you know, it doesn't matter. People can bring it right to my face, and I'm like, go on. And I have absolutely no urge. In fact, I don't even attract people to me who are in that scene anymore. If you do it, I just simply... You don't want you part of it. Don't want part of it. I don't need yeah. to be around it. Right. You know, and like... And here's the bottom line. People that are addicts, it's a disease. Mm. And people don't want to call it a disease, but it is a disease. And I woke up one day with MS. Um, I didn't know anything about MS. I had to learn about it. And I had to figure out how am I going to be okay? I want to live a really good life. My son woke up one day. He did not have a drug until he was 21 years old at all. He had been in a movie with Chris Farley when he was younger called Beverly Hills Ninja. He played Chris as, as, as oh. a young Haru. And this is this movie. And about a year and a half later, Chris died. And Jason was devastated. He loved Chris. He, he just did. And he was too young to sort of embrace the idea of what addiction was in that, in that time. Um, he did, after that, he, he wrote an amazing screenplay called Just One More Day. If you could have that person come back for one more day, how would you spend that t precious 24 wow. hours? Wow. Oh, my and gosh. It, it was really good. And it, it, at the time, it got um, optioned for a TV movie of the week. And he was only 12. And it was it was really kind of from his his eyes and what, what he saw and what he thought. It didn't get made at that time. But um, later on, um, I'll tell you a story. I, um, I was having the worst time dealing with the loss of my son. I talked to a psychic one day and the psychic says, you know, your son wants you to write a book and you're going to write a book. I'm like, no, I'm not. I, I can't even see straight. I'm so depressed. I, I lost my son and I, I don't know how to get out of this. I said, no, you're definitely going to do that. So I went to the cemetery that day to visit my son and started really thinking long and hard about this thing. And I came home and I've moved like twice. So to find something in my house is always kind of complicated. I walked into what was what had been a room that Jason had stayed in. And all of a sudden that script called Just One More Day was sitting right on the top of everything. And I'm like, wow. That was never that so, No, it wow. wasn't. So wow. I, I read it and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, this is what I need to do because I don't know what happened. Where did Jason go when he died? Why did he really yeah. die? What happened that night? I, I didn't get to say goodbye. I didn't get to say anything. Yeah. I felt so bad and guilty and awful. So that night, I started writing my Just One More Day. If I could have Jason come back for one day, what would I do? And for the next six months, I kept writing it every night. And all of a sudden, all that I couldn't heal from, it started sort of gradually lifting and kind of going away. And I, I, I created oh. my own narrative to the story and what had happened. And I, I got answers to questions that were just making me insane. And every night, I felt felt like I was with him and I was writing the story and I was I was I kept redoing it and redoing it in ways that he would want what would be the perfect day for Jason what would he if he could do anything for 24 hours what would he do and I I, I really came up with that and then I felt really satisfied and um, I talked to my book agent about it and she wants me to do it so I'm, I'm doing a book called oh just one gosh, more day congratulations. yes congratulations well you, you can come back on here once the book's yes. out and we will talk about it and discuss it right and and, and, I, and I also like. to top it all off. Uh, Jason's book will be somehow included with that too. But also, um, we're doing a song um, uh, for Can, and we're, we're it's it's kind of a We Are the World inspired um, 
uh, song. I mean, it's a, a very modern day with fabulous artists, and we're, st we're still putting it together. It's 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 kind of crazy, a lot of work. And um, the the songwriter who is brilliant, uh, her name is Madison Love, and my my friend Cindy Harrell Horn. Uh, we all worked together, and Roger Love too, and uh, and Colin Love. We all worked on this song, and it's called Just One More Day, and it so is so beautiful, the most beautiful song, and it's it's that story of. Um, you're that person, you get that call. I was, uh, when Jason passed away, I was, I was in a snowstorm in Aspen walking through the snow and it, it kind of talked about that and you get that one call and how one call changes it all. Mm. Uh, when you have a loved one who's an addict, it's that phone call that changes your life. Wow. You don't know when that phone rings in the middle of the night, is yeah. that person dead? Well, are well, they at the hospital? Are they arrested? Um, are is somebody holding them ra for ransom? I mean, all those yeah. things do happen. How did he get into the opiates at the beginning what was the sort of so yeah here's what happened he was so anti-drugs and he had, had these anti-drug things at his his high school it was really pretty amazing and i knew he would never use drugs because of that so cut to it's his brother's wedding and uh, we're in uh, newport he'd hurt his back it was he had a burn a bad burn on his back he was in a lot of pain a friend of his goes up to him and says well if you smoke opium um, that'll really help you get rid of the pain. And he, he wasn't thinking, it was kind of a stressful wedding. It was a, a lot of things going on. And he smoked opium, which is the candy-coated way of saying heroin. Um, you know, people call things different things than they really are, but he liked it. Um, he really liked it, and he got really addicted really quickly after not having a drug or a drink at t till he was 21. That was pretty terrible. And so that just sort of opened the door. And for the next, um, I, I guess, 12 years off and on, he had an addiction. And he would, he'd would he be well, then he'd, he'd fall off the wagon. He, he went to rehab. He did a terrible show called Celebrity Rehab. It's the worst show on the planet where they sort of glorify people who are addicts and, and shame them more than they're already shamed. And it was really an embarrassing, horrible thing that, that happened to him. He was funny, though. He was an actor. He'd been on the Roseanne show a lot. And you know he'd been in a bunch of movies and stuff. He's kind of a fun, loving kid, but that was sort of—it was just a big low point in his life. And uh, he'd been sober till that point, but it was—it was really hard. He was this like amazing, fun, creative kid. He could do anything. He could play the piano. He could sing. Uh, even after he passed away, someone said, "Do you want me to share the opera that we wrote?" Uh, you know, Jason and I wrote. I'm like, "What opera?" He doesn't know how to write an opera. He goes, "Well, he did." I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" Anyway, he was fabulous. So a lot of why I do this charity cure addiction now is in his honor and his memory and. I, I I can see that this is the leading cause of death in our country. And now if you add the fentanyl crisis that's going yeah. on, um, every day so much fentanyl comes over our border. Um, it's it, All the Mexican drug lords are pressing fentanyl into every possible drug you could imagine, even heart drugs and antidepressants and all these different things. And they look just like your other drugs. And people are buying these on the street and um, they're getting fentanyl. It's a much cheaper thing to use, but it's, 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 there's enough fentanyl in our country right now to kill every American seven times over. Oh my gosh. It's that's terrifying. a terrible statistic. It's a terrible so statistic. It's, so fentanyl is not usually in the normal drugs or at all in the drugs that are over the no. Mm -hmm. people most people wouldn't want fentanyl however some people who are real hardened addicts have gotten addicted to that because it's been laced in their their drugs but it's the equivalent of you having 50 to 100 shots of heroin could you live through that your body couldn't take it no. and that's what it is and even when kids you're hearing about kids buying this on snapchat and whatever yeah. they're buying one pill and the, we, we have this campaign, one pill can kill, because one pill can kill. Um, sometimes they're breaking that pill into four, four pieces, and four kids are all ODing on it. And it's, it's really terrifying how strong that really is. So um, another thing that we're really advocating is that everybody uses something called Narcan. Um, yeah. Everybody needs to have Narcan. Which you gave me before we yeah. began. And I have my little box here. I, I have, I have and I... Narcan. Can you imagine a life where you effortlessly magnetize your dreams to you? Financial success, the love of your life, the family of your dreams, and everything you've ever dreamed of at your fingertips. With my approach to manifesting, I have a practical method where you use the power of your creative words. It's called scripting. We write in the past tense in a certain way to attract all our desires to us. I've done this. I met my husband in three weeks doing this. I helped myself heal twice. 
I helped myself get rid of a rash on my body. I have helped myself to elevate myself and get myself out there to so many people. I've changed my bank account number. I've added two zeros onto it. I have created abundance like I could never dream of. The most beautiful homes around the world. And you can do this too, like so many of my clients are currently doing right now. The success stories speak for themselves. I wanna show you how to do it. This is for somebody who is ready though. Don't even bother coming unless you are ready to transform your life. If you feel like, oh, I'm on the fence, I don't know, none of this shit really works, then baby, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for you. This works for somebody who says, I'm ready. I'm ready to try something else. Try using the power of my words. I wanna learn in a curriculum. I wanna be in a group with other like-minded individuals and I wanna win. This is for entrepreneurs who are ready to go to the next level or maybe get out of corporate America and go to the entrepreneurship world. If you're ready, come and join us inside the Scripting Society and I'll see you there. Right here. here. We go. And this can save somebody's life. Tell us what this is that this you created. Is, this is it. This is now available over the counter. It used to be you couldn't get it over the counter. You'd have to have a prescription. Um, sometimes there's Narcan giveaways, and we're trying to do Narcan giveaways and what have you. So um, what happens is when you open a thing of Narcan, it has two, two doses in there. Um, this is one dose. You lay somebody on the ground. If somebody has passed out from any kind of an opiate overdose, um, you have four minutes till they're brain damaged. You have six minutes till they are dead. If you call 911, there's a really good chance that they won't come for at least 10 minutes. This is how you have to be empowered to save someone's life. It works against, it reverses the whole thing of what's happening. So it's really important to have this. You have this, you just spray the bottom, you lay somebody flat on their back, put it up their nostril, turn their head to the right, and they will probably come to it. You might need a second dose um, after a while. They might wake up and then sort of fall back asleep. That's why each, each Narcan comes with two doses. It's really important to have this. But even every kid needs to have it in their backpack, going to school, going to a party, uh, in your purse or whatever it is. I mean, there's no reason now. If you should use it and the person didn't pass out from an, an overdose of opiates, yeah. it's not going to harm them yeah. either. So it's it's not a bad thing to have it and to, to give it to somebody. It's, it's really important to have Narcan. So fascinating. I think you're really just leading the way. You're such a pioneer for so many things. You, I believe that some, I mean, I went through my own uh, health challenge uh, six years ago. And so we are people who have overcome something. Yes. But why is it that it happens to certain people and, and not others? And my answer for that, that I've come to realize, and we were speaking about this before, is it happens to those of us who have a voice, who are meant to go on and share with the world how we healed. I made an agreement the day that I was in my lowest point of the illness I was facing, I had an overactive thyroid, hypothyroidism. I was on heart medication because I was on the high end wow. of it. It was so, so horrendous. And I remember literally begging to keep my life. All I wanted to do was, was be around to raise my son. He was eight, uh, sorry, at the time he was six months old, wow. all the way through till he was like- way, Having kids makes you yeah. grown up and very responsible. Very, you very don't fast. Have, you, you, you don't think about yourself. You don't. It, most people don't. It become, but that gave me my why to heal. Yes. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to heal. But then it wasn't enough. I needed, I needed something more. And suddenly I'm standing in the mirror and I hear this voice of Denzel Washington. And Denzel Washington is playing in a motivational speaking track that I found on YouTube. And he's like, you are going to get out of this. And I start hearing the words as though he's speaking to my soul. And it was like, you are going to overcome this. This is just temporary. Pain is just temporary. It is not your destiny. It's not who you're going to be. And I listened to it over and over and I suddenly started crying, having this huge breakthrough wow. and realized, oh my goodness, I'm going to get out of this. This is just temporary. So I said to the universe, God, if you heal me, I will go on and I will share it with the world. Right. If you show me how to heal, I will show the world how to heal and I will change my life. I will use the platforms. I already had a platform and I will use my platform to help other people in the world. And to this day, I have never stopped helping people. It may not be just all health now. I help people in so many ways, but that's been the absolute line of my why. But when you help people just in general, it, it does help their health. It helps everything. You're right. It's it the does. whole big picture. You're Even right. You might, they need help with the, with a job, with the you know, inspiring to, to yes. do something or having the confidence system that changes your entire health. It as does. Well. It, it also, does. Well, it do, saves a lot of lives. It does. You're right. It does. But don't you feel as well when, because you've been someone who, who's who gone through and going through something that when it, you know, you, you have that feeling inside of you on a bad day, you just think about somebody else and it helps you get better. 
When you take yeah. it off yourself, yeah. like you stop thinking about your problems, you focus on healing other people like you do every day. You wake up and you have these charities and you're like, how can I get this out there to more people? How can I cure more addiction problems? How can I get this information into your hands? How can I help people with MS? And you're doing that. So that's why I believe that yeah. the universe gave you what right. you went through yeah. so that you would grow through it and share thank it with the world. You, thank you. I, I believe I believe you're right because when I was first diagnosed, as I'm sure you were, you were like, why me? What did I do? What, why am I attracting Every this? Day, and you why feel me? really yep. sorry for yourself. And then I'm not good at feeling sorry for myself for too long because I'm not good at being depressed. I, I'm very optimistic yeah, in, in a I ridiculous way. I, I just believe everything positive. You glow. You can yeah. see everything. So Every time I speak I, to you, you're like um, super upbeat. So when I was diagnosed, I, I was like... I, I, I did the depressed thing for a couple of days. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. This is not my job description. I, I can't sit around feeling sorry for myself. And I can't stay home and I can't watch TV all day. I'm not going to worry about operating only the remote control of my TV set. I, I have so much life to live. I yeah. have things to do. I have, I, have to, I have to accomplish a lot. And so I felt sorry for myself initially. And then I thought, you know, how can I change this? I mean, nobody's doing this. And if I don't do it, no one's going to touch mm. this. So you started thinking about other and people. And so all of a sudden you think about like, I mean, a lot of people could have done a lot of things, but maybe they didn't. And so you were put on this earth to do something bigger than yourself, better yes. than yourself. And yes. there's no better feeling than when I get a letter or a note or a phone call from somebody who tells me that I have actually changed the whole trajectory of their life and their, their health, their well, because of something wow. I did. And that's probably the most powerful high that you can get from anybody is hearing that you've actually made their life better. There's nothing better than that. I know. When I get testimonials back from people saying you've saved my life you saved my daughter's life you saved my mother's life you changed my life yeah. you helped me to improve my life in some way sometimes i cry from those testimonials sometimes they are so moving yeah. to know that i helped somebody heal through a challenging illness as well yeah. like i went through to know that the work that i'm doing is reaching these people is so emotional it's why i do it every day but i think it Just, gave you a new job description um <laughs> as uh you probably would have never uh, seeked all that out and, and, and found that that important thing. And, and I'm sure it inspires you every day to be able to wake up and, and read those testimonials and uh, learn all the things that you've done to change people's lives for the better. I mean, there's not there's not a better high. Uh, no, there was always talking right. about what is what is the greatest thing? What's the highest high? I'm like, oh, my God, just getting a letter that somebody you changed someone's life. It's like, wow, I, I, that's just so much to own. I know. I know. It I, really is. So empowering. I love I love yeah. hearing you say that because you are doing it every single day. For someone listening today, if you feel like you're suffering with something, first of all, just think about somebody else. Somebody else is always in a worse state Absolutely. than we are. So you are somebody's idol. Like where I sit now and where I, even then when I was in the illness, I was in a better place. Somebody dreamt of being able to talk, right. dreamt of being able to walk, dreamt of being, and so I was yeah. already. And right. so it just goes all the way up. We all, everyone always has somebody they idolize being more like right. until you heal fully. But I think when you're, when you're, you're, when you're down, it sort of feeds off itself. And I, I learned, uh, there were some down times that one of the best things I could do, I, I read a book called The Secret a, a long yep. time ago. And it She's really, been on the show. Rhonda. Okay. So it really, it really helped me. And the idea of, you know, you can always sit there and, uh, say, oh, this bad thing happened and that bad thing happened and now this is going to happen. Well, if you plan it, it will happen. But if you plan that only good things are going to happen and you think about all the positives that you have, your life is different. So I wake up every morning, I say a certain prayer, I, I open the drapes, I look out and I, I list at least 10 things every day that I am happy and grateful for in my life. So beautiful. And when I do that, it doesn't give me time to think about all the things that aren't right because we all have things that aren't right, but yeah. we forget to manifest the positive, the things that are working for us, and, and just sort of pinch yourself for a minute and say, this is great. Um, I, I always, I'm so grateful for, for my husband. Um, I'm, I, he has, I have the greatest husband. So I, every day I'm, I'm grateful for my, my husband. I'm grateful for my mother. I have a 93-year-old mother. Wow. And she's, she's still doing really well. She's got her wits about her. She's amazing. And that's wonderful. My kids, my, my son, my son, Brandon, I'm so grateful for him. And he's, he's getting married. He's having a baby. Wow. And I'm so, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for my daughter Mariella and um, she's she's been on a boat traveling but I'm, I'm so excited that you know she's she's doing well I'm so excited for my daughter Isabella and you know just all the different things I'm, I'm grateful for the cherries but I make myself really think about it I, and it's easy to go like what do I not have but what do I have 
And when you make yourself really feel that each of those things is a great accomplishment, it, it sort of feeds and it sets yourself up for the rest of the day, um, doing positive things and thinking positive things and not dwelling on negatives. It does. That's what we call scripting. So I teach scripting is what I did my TED talk on. Scripting for your dream life in health, money, love, happiness, in any area of your life, you can do it. Where you begin your day and you end your day with writing your story writing a story that you want, that you want to happen, the goals you wish to achieve as though you already have achieved them. So you write it in the past tense. So I'm so grateful that I made X amount of money. I'm so grateful that my health came back better yeah. than ever. I'm yeah. so grateful that my child improved in school, whatever it yes. might be. Write a, a gratitude but list. But anything, no matter how big or little it is, it makes you feel good in yes. that day. It just makes you have that little endorphin that, that you know, of course, if our children do well in, in school or anything um, whenever something good happens to my kids it makes me so happy it just does and those are the endorphins but that makes you that makes your life good and when you notice and you make a big deal about it to yourself I think it encourages more positive things to happen I absolutely agree I couldn't I couldn't sit with you more on that gratitude is the key to your future. Gratitude is the key to everything. I agree. Giving gratitude, the way that you said, I, I do a certain prayer every morning and then I give gratitude. Gratitude can change your mood. Gratitude can change your day. Simply by thinking what you do have, like you said so beautifully, rather than what you don't have, you will attract more of those things. That's what this show is, Law of Attraction Secrets. Right. It's all the secrets behind life, all the secrets behind living your best life, the secrets behind the law of attraction. How do you activate it? How do you make it work? Well, it's happening whether you like it or not. The law of attraction is you attracting what you are. It's you attracting what you think, what you behave You're attracting like. attracting your, your best self. Yes. As opposed to your worst self. Absolutely. Well, that's what you want to do. Absolutely. You want to attract your best but, self. But I, I think everybody can do an inventory on their life and see, I've got this many good things, this many bad things, but hopefully the good things outweigh the bad. Maybe yes. if you make a big deal about the good things that more good things will be filling up that column in that is life. such a good tip i love that so things even as small as i'm grateful for the food in my fridge i'm grateful i have a roof over my head that is such a big deal right or i got a parking place right in front of yes where I'm going. i love that that's what ronda talks yeah. about in the book little, i know it's so things. good yeah i did say i did see that in the, the book the secret they said if you envision that that parking place is going to be available ahead of time it's sometimes waiting for you which Do you know is half of the people who wrote the the book inside well you know the co-authors inside from the movie They've all been on the show. I coach alongside John Asaraf and his wow. program. I co-host co the Brainathon to hundred, I think, a hundred thousand people. I would love to meet um, them. Oh my gosh! Well, I'll I bring them to them. one of your. Yeah, bring you know, it to my event. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michael Beckwith. He's often at oh, my wow. home. We have uh, a very close friendship. We coach together in his programs. He coaches in mine sometimes. Uh, Doctor Di Martini. He's been on the show. I mean, I could list out oh, wow, so that's many. Great. I have very close friendships with. Oh, them. That's wonderful. Rhonda is now my mentor. Oh, she's, she's amazing. amazing. I, that amazing. was. 360. I watched the I've movie done, yeah, at 15. I, I, I've seen that. You, I, I, I just feel it saved me at a certain part of my life. It made me. Uh, it just it, it turned everything around and and made me under, understand like how much I did have and not how little I didn't have and and wow. uh, and to focus on what was positive and I think the more you, more you do that every day look we all we all can find something bad <laughs> I mean some people are just such negative people they walk outside and they there's like one cloud in the sky they go it's cloudy but the rest of the sky is beautiful like why are you why are you focusing on that because that you're gonna you're making yourself miserable like you know. why are you doing that Well I lived in Vancouver for a year. And every day I walk my son to school and it was raining for 70% of the year it rains there. And well, I don't know the actual number, but I'm pretty sure it's about 70%, mm -hmm. maybe higher. And um, we'd walk to school and it would be raining or snowing in the winter. And when we got to school, so many people would be like, oh, moaning, other moms, parents, moaning about the, the weather and how drizzly it was. And I would just sit and think to myself, I'm so grateful that we have such an abundant climate, that yeah. we have so much food here that we can eat, that's freshly grown, that we have all this rain that creates this most magnificent backdrop of right. this view of the world. And the rain, I would go out and dance in it. And I would go and dance in it Love and dance it. in it. And I, and my husband at the time would be like looking out the window in our home and I'd be dancing by the pool and he'd be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm having the time of my life because everybody else is focused on the rain and the negatives. Mm -hmm. Somebody in Africa has absolutely right, no rain right now, is living in a drought and is desperate for food. We are abundant. We have rain. I'm so grateful. That's Doesn't funny. mean I want to live here forever and I won't make a scene of it. I want to move to LA and I did, but I didn't make a scene of the rain. I loved it. So the universe said, I'm going to give you more of 
what you love. That's Not right. necessarily more rain, just more of what I loved. So I quit focusing on the bad things and I look around me and I would help other people to be inspired. But like, wait, we've got rain, yes, but why is rain good? And somebody would be like, well, I don't see it in a positive in the rain. And I'd right. be like, well, there is, po and then they'd find a positive and they'd be like, you really turned my mindset around just from that one thing. That's interesting. Yeah. So we, we, like you say, we stop focusing on the cloud in the sky. Yeah. If you look for bad, you find it. If you look for good, you find it. And you have a much better life if you look for the good and, and acknowledge it and pinch yourself and know that you're super lucky to be able to have goodness in your life. I agree. How have you gotten through some of the hard times when you've, you've been through some challenges with your own health and with the loss of your son? And how did you, I mean, they are two things that most people would not come back from, but you stand here as such an inspiration. You host the most fantastic events. You are a, a philanthropist on the highest level. You're oh, bringing you. people together. You are a true gift to this world. Thank God for Nancy Davis. Oh, but what, how did you get through these times? You know, uh, when my son Jason died and I got the call from my husband, I was in Aspen, I was away with my other daughter. Yeah. Um, I didn't know how I was going to survive. I, I, that was the lowest point I've ever felt, uh, the most desperate, the most sad. Yeah. And I, I just didn't know how. And I, I really, it took a while. Yeah. It definitely took a while. I talked to lots of friends. I talked to psychics. I read lots of books. Um, I felt there was no book that was go, was anything about what I was going through. Some friends were very kind to send books on grief. They, they didn't do anything for me. They made me uh, feel like I wasn't a part of this because they were more about grief of like maybe an elderly parent mm -hmm. who already died or something like that. But when you lose a child at a young age, it's, it's a very different type of grief. And there's, there are lots of different griefs. When I finally started writing my own book, um, Just One More Day, I would say that was the moment that I started feeling better. I started wow. healing. I started thinking there was a, a, a positive thing that I could do to help other people. Um, having this charity, Cure Addiction Now, that was something Jason you know, was so affected by in his life. Having this and the idea of saving lives, um, it, it, it kind of, to me, it's, 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 it's an honor to him. And it, it it gets me through something. I'm very sad still. Um, when I see him, I, I go to the cemetery a lot and I see him and I'm like, what, what are you doing here? It's, it's just like, uh, I'm, I'm older than you and it's not normal. It's not, not how God created for uh, parents to bury yeah. their children. It's just not okay. And it makes me sad, but I feel, I feel good on another hand that he would be so happy. And when I see those sunsets at night, um, especially on the days we're working really hard, making really good results with all of our doctors, I feel, you know, I feel vindicated a bit and I feel like this is what he would want and um, this is how I can honor him and, and get through it. Um, if I didn't have that, I, I don't know how I would get through yeah. it. Yeah, I think that that happened for a reason. The fact that just before he went to the you know different realm he decided to let you know mom this is the charity we've got to do and he, oh, yeah. he must have in a big way foreseen through his subconscious mind without knowing in the conscious what was going to happen but he perhaps he just knew in his soul i've got to do this now for whatever reason right. and then he set it up in time knowing that this was going to have a profound impact and that was why he was here on planet earth yeah. to change the life of people who have addiction yeah. He, I think he was, and and he he got into it late. I mean, a lot of people start doing it very young, but he obviously had that genetic predisposition to becoming an addict, and a lot of people have that, and they don't plan on being an addict one day. And some people start later, some start earlier. But your body has a genetic predisposition, and we're we're working on vaccines and different things that are going to identify that and hopefully help other people so they don't have to go to that rabbit hole. Because once you become an addict, people are so unkind and so unfair and so mean. There's such a terrible stigma that exists on addicts, and it's it's really wrong. So I'm really setting out to change that because it is a disease. Um, if I told somebody today, if I called someone and said um, I was just diagnosed with MS, I, I called a friend. I'm sure she would say to me, "Oh my gosh, let me take you to the doctor. Or I'll send you flowers or a cake or something. I'll be there for you." But if I called that same friend and said, "You know what? I'm an addict," they'd probably say, "Well, you know, go to rehab and call me when you get out." And all of a sudden, you're isolated. You feel sad. You feel really lonely. People don't want to 
embrace you. They're not kind no, to you. They're right. really not kind so to people. Sad. Even doctors who I've talked to, they don't want to have an addict sitting in their office. They don't. They think it's bad for their business, and it's it's pretty true. It's very true, and it's pretty th pathetic. But we have spent so much time making addicts feel really bad and not doing anything. If you look at our homeless population, a good portion of the homeless population are, are addicted to drugs and and or have a mental illness. And part of our charity is is you you have to work on both the mental illness and the addiction mm -hmm. in order to get mm -hmm. better you can't just do one without the other it doesn't work that way mm -hmm. yes. but it's it's really it's really so sad to look at this um by by offering um places for homeless people to live it's great but you're missing the whole elephant in the room here because you're not working on how do we take them off their addiction they they go to hotels whatever and they wake up in the morning and their body is screaming for drugs yeah and they're going to beg borrow steal plead kill to get them why are we not looking at the big picture we need to have the whole picture together not just a place to live we need to have a, a program a rehab or or something to help these people get sober detox in a safe way and be able to figure out job skills life skills and not not put them in this terrible thing we're always saying oh our, our jails are so overrun with people committing crimes a lot of the people that are in jail it's because of drugs yeah because they've had to commit crimes because they're they're addicts yeah. and they they don't know how to survive without that sometimes it's somebody's you know drunk driving or on drugs yeah. and driving and they cause an accident to a very innocent person they don't mean to do that but they have a disease and we have to look at this as a disease it is a it's the worst disease it is the biggest killer of any disease and we have to stop brushing this under the rug and looking the other way because mm. people do and people think, well, you know, that person had a choice. And because they chose to do drugs, they, they don't count. They don't matter. They're yeah. not a good person. Everybody and every mind counts. Everybody's important. They're Beautiful. important to somebody. So true. And it's important to figure out if we want to stop this, we need to figure out drugs and medications to start really early on and vaccines, perhaps, to stop people from going down this terrible rabbit hole of what it costs. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I've learned so much myself and somebody that went through that and could have gone a different way and somehow- Congratulations, you know, because yeah, thank um, you. when you're telling me your story yeah. with cocaine, uh, you're you're very fortunate and you're very driven. And I, I think you you did something brilliant, which should be something for a lot of people to look up to that what you did. I, I congratulate because I know thank that's not you. easy. Well, I had a near death experience uh, one morning on a come down um, and I, I my son was so young and I just went, oh my God. And I just remember that moment thinking I'm gonna probably die right now. What happened? Um, I'd taken too much and I was just having a really bad come down. I do like, I was shaking, my body was on it. And they, everyone in the home who was there with me uh, was like wanting to call the hospital, call an ambulance. And I was like, no, I was like, I need to like, just go through whatever I'm going through. And I did. And, and I just remember thinking I'm never going back to this place if I survive. And I did. I didn't know oh, wow. that word. And you didn't go to the hospital? No. I just had the worst. I mean, I won't go into it. It's just the yeah. but it was just a really. Well, thank God yeah. you, you did that. And I think I'm sure you learned a very powerful lesson. And yeah. having your son, I mean. That well, was my son being in the other room, that was my big breaking point. And he was so young, tiny. And I was like, I'm never going to be here again. And I have never touched it since. Amazing. And I would, I just avoid anything like that. I can have, red wine, wine was there, drinking was never an issue for me, so it was never my drug. So a glass of red wine sporadically throughout the year is no problem. That's never been a problem for me. Um, I've never tried a spirit in my life because that's way too close to anything that right. to me that would be with addiction. I was addicted to smoking. That was really hard for me to quit. I've smoked oh, yeah. since I was 13 years old. I quit three yeah, years people ago. People have a really hard time quitting Re well, smoking. That was it's, a big like one. one another worst. big addiction. So that was another one. Um, and then I hit, yeah, I've started, I replaced smoking with breathing. So I do breath work. Now three years out, I, you know, I have no desire to smoke. That's amazing. Um, thank God. But I have to stay away from things and recognize that, you know, I now I live in a place where it's all about my body is my temple healing. Right. Um, I really don't enjoy late nights. I don't enjoy right. anything that throws me because off. Because you I just, have a bigger purpose. Yes, in life. exactly. Yeah. 
One of our doctors, um, Dr. Kaplan, he, he's a, a therapist. He works both with race, race, MS, and cure addiction now. He, he talks about how important it is in life to have your PIL, that pill, which is purpose in life versus having the PILL, which a lot of people take pills to think that that's going to make them feel better. But once you find whatever your purpose in life is and you sort of state that to yourself and you have a, a, your, that ambition, the PIL will really save your life. Wow, I love that. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Let's take that beautiful P-I-L-L -L away, the, the correct version of it. Thank you to everybody who has been here today tuning in. Thank you for all of your ears, your time. I hope that this has helped you. I have learned so much myself. I know this has touched somebody in the way that it needed to. Thank you so much, Nancy, for coming thank today. For thank you for being here. We send you love and light and blessings for all the work that you're doing in the world. Yeah. Nancy's links are below to all the charities and anything that you want to learn more about. I'll see you again next time.